All right, boys, I gotta ask, what is your favorite movie standoff? Well, I think uh, I think without question for me, I don't think it'd be a surprise for either you boys, but uh, it's got to be the ending of the good, the bad, and the ugly, the three way duel between uh, Blondie, Angel Eyes, and Tuco. I just Sergio Leone's directorial power was at a tight there with the way he just draws out the tension. Ennio Morricone, rest in peace, boss. His music just just stretching this tension out to the fucking breaking point. And then just the way you're building and building and building. There's three guys. Who's going to focus on who? Where's it going to happen? What's going to happen? And then bam, Blondie wins. And then you realize Tuco's gun is broken. Then you realize, oh wait, Blondie fucked up his gun earlier in the, in the movie, knowing full well what was going to happen. Blondie cheated the most fucking man with no name thing ever giving it an entirely new layer when you're watching the movie again it's just the best what about you grandpa uh probably the showdown between larry the cable guy and uh danny trejo in delta farce all right that's it okay okay go home do not forsake us oh my darling we're talking 1952's high noon here on you're missing out with special guest kenny nybart Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Natale. I'm Tom Lorenzo. And this is You're Missing Out. We are today talking about High Noon with our guest. You know him from podcasts like it's 1999. Uh, it is Kenny Nybart. Thank you for having me, guys. Our pleasure, my friend. I should have asked, do you have any other credits you want to mention there in the beginning? I completely forgot to ask that. I'm so sorry. Oh, uh... Do you want me to redo that? Yeah. I don't care. I mean, I, lo- I, I, I like putting it out raw. You know how we are, so... I'll just no. I I write on, I write on Step Up right now on um on Stars. I wrote on Hindsight. I wrote an Entourage, which comes up a lot, um and some other shit. And uh, and uh, but mostly podcasts like it's nineteen ninety nine. That's that's what I really enjoy doing. Well, like I was telling you off mic, and I, I told Phil on an episode that may or may not come up for this, uh, that we're, we're huge fans of your show. We always have been. And uh, we're so glad that you uh, decided to come on here. Before I get into this, uh, we always read the little excerpt of why the National Film Registry said that they selected this film. Gary Cooper is a sheriff who's about to marry Quaker Grace Kelly and hang up his star, but is forced into a final gunfight alone when the townspeople refuse to help him. The film's 84 tense minutes are meant to correspond with the actual time in which the plot unfolds. Carl Foreman wrote the script and planned to direct it until the Hollywood blacklist intervened and Fred Zinneman was tapped to take over. Supporting actors include Thomas Mitchell, Lon Chaney Jr., Lloyd Bridges, and Katie Gerardo. Beside Cooper's tout Oscar-winning performance, the most unforgettable element of the film may be its theme song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darlin', by Dimitri Tiomkin and Ned Washington. So that is why the registry selected it. Now, Kenny, why did you pick this film to talk about? Um, well, you sent me the list and, uh, as you know, a lot of these are kind of your canonical American classics and some of them are, you know, from the silent era and then there's star Wars, but, um, (laughs) this, this stood out to me on the list, uh, because I, I, I guess there is this idea of the Western being one of the few pure American art forms. And they probably felt like they should have a Western in. And I had never seen this movie. And I was really interested to kind of get into why this was the Western that the National Film Registry decided to um, canonize in their first class. Particularly because it's not necessarily the one that I uh, sensed was kind of the great American Western. Um, Again, having not seen it. So I've always wanted to see it. Um, it's always kind of, you know, the, the real time of it has always kind of interested me. Um, excuse me, that's my door opening. has always kind of interested me and excited me. Uh, I obviously knew the story to some extent, but um, it did feel a little unusual when you look down the list that has your Wizards of Oz and Gone with the Wind and Citizen Kane and those kinds of movies. So uh, that's more or less what I was thinking. That's interesting. Let me let me ask just in general because this I I think you have you have done maybe two westerns on your show already, right? Well, is Wild Wild West a western? Oh God! I promised. Tom- <laughs> the best thing is I promised Tom that I wouldn't say it, and I didn't say it, so it's fine. I found the loophole, yeah. but yes, yeah, Wild- I think that's called entrapment. <laughs> uh, well- 
No, but you've done you've done Wild Wild West and Ravenous. I don't think there's that many pure westerns in that year. I think maybe Ride with the Devil is that year or something like that. But which is westernish? It's like there. It's almost more of a southern in the uh, Django Unchained kind of thing. But um, yeah, it, westerns is, is obviously not to cut you off, Mike. But uh, westerns obviously you know an American art form that was massive until it wasn't, right? Yep. Well, it's uh, funny, too, because um, there is actually one other Western in the first year list, and it is kind of funny because we'll get to this gentleman, everyone's favorite social justice warrior, John Wayne. (laughs) Um, The Searches was in the first year. Oh, was Um, it? Oh, because the Searches is the one I would have expected to be. So I guess I missed it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Okay. But 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 it is funny just because John Wayne very much kind of, at least until Clint Eastwood, is the western guy hated high noon yeah and he made a movie as a response to high noon which is uh rio bravo which we'll we'll Um, touch on we'll touch on in a bit i want to get into this film first but kenny what is what is your relationship to the western genre in general did you grow up with them are you a fan of anyone's in particular or so the the searchers is uh my favorite and the best western i think i've ever seen um i hate john wayne but uh, I think that's um, – not as an actor, but I mean John Wayne is John Wayne, right? So I think that you know, The Searchers is an amazing movie. Uh, I wouldn't say I grew up with a Western. Um, I've gotten into the West, Western probably in the last eight to ten years or something kind of um, – there, there, there are two things I really love about it. One, I love kind of pioneering American history. Um, I'm – fundamentally kind of taken with the the notion of going east to west and kind of um the 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 building up of american american society so high noon really speaks to me in that way like the um the founding of laws the founding of a town the founding of kind of principles that guide us uh there so there's that um yeah and like obviously the problem with with westerns is so few of them grapple with the other side of the coin you know the searchers does to some extent but the uh the mass genocide that that took place so a movie like high noon it really kind of plays with the the themes and the ideas about the western that i find really interesting I grew up, I knew High Noon, uh, you know, my whole life I grew up with that. It was one of, it was probably my favorite Western until uh, I think maybe I saw Once Upon a Time in the West, which maybe takes that title now. Uh, Whereas Tom has been a big Western guy for a long time, but you only saw that fairly recently too, right? High Noon? Yeah, I mean, I've been a Western guy kind of my whole life. My dad always watched them. And um, I just, I I was never a John Wayne guy, even before, you know, everybody, every, you know, six months, that Playboy interview is recirculated as if it's new news. Um, (laughs) I just never liked the guy. So like, I I could watch The Searchers and I watched Stagecoach last week and I'll be like, yeah, these are great movies that I enjoy in spite of my just almost chemical intolerance for John Wayne's persona. Um, But I watched High Noon last year um, in uh, a bit of research for a script I was writing. And just immediately, it just hit me right in the face of just like, oh, this, yeah, this is one of the best just Westerns I've ever seen. Just one of the best movies, period, I've ever seen. Just, um, I mean, we'll get into all the reasons why, (coughs) excuse me, in a bit. But just such a tight, smart, just unbelievable, like one of those movies that's like, how did nobody think of this beforehand? It's just such like one of those structures that you could just keep doing every year and just mm-hmm. re- redo it in a way, kind of like Rio Bravo just picked, made that perfect structure. And you just go, you just say, all right, run with it. Just do, do your new thing. So what do you guys think? Do you want to, should we, what do you want to address first? Do you want to address the, the background of how this film came together or the actual plot of the film? What's, uh, what's more interesting to, to you guys? Well, it's funny. I think uh, you can't talk about this movie without the background because of how deeply entwined it is with the Red Scare of the time. It really informed everything and how it was, for most of the people involved, the high points of their career, or in Gary Cooper's case, the last high point of his career. And then the Red Scare kind of 
kind of knocked Carl Foreman out of the business for in many ways. I mean, he wrote Bridge on the River Kwai, but he couldn't take credit for it because of the Red Scare. Uh, you know, Stanley Kramer kind of took a lot more credit for the movie because Carl Foreman wasn't really around to take credit for it. So Stanley Kramer kind of started doing movies and getting stuff going like uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And just like we said, John Wayne, American icon, took real umbrage to this movie that made the American frontier look un just un just just there were no morals that it made it look unclean and he said I don't like that partner and 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 and, and peopled by cowards which is like I it, that does seem to be like what he took uh umbrage with to me right now I oh, understand yeah. I understand like that it's read as a uh, anti-communist, or excuse me, an, an anti-McCarthyism parable, which I think is what Carl Foreman intended. I think. Yeah. It, I think the beauty of this is that it actually, you know, can be put on, put onto almost any situation, crafted onto almost any situation, um, where you have a person who's being assailed by dark forces and can't find anybody else to take up that cause with them. So, which is, you know, as you guys know, this is this was. One of Eisenhower's favorite movies. This is one of Clinton's favorite movies. This is one of Reagan's favorite movies. So a bunch of different people with a bunch of different ideologies saw themselves in Will Kane. Uh, Reagan's a real interesting one to to maybe like this film. Let's uh, you know, because uh, he was a uh, big into the uh, the, the red naming, scare, the naming of the names. But the uh, naming of the that was that was his thing. He uh, he named names. But hey, you know, whatever. He he ransacked. Yeah, he, he he was all for it. He uh he kind of he kind of shanghaied a lot of people. Um, Carl Foreman kind of got a part of that too. Um, it's also funny. Gary Cooper was gonna stand up for Carl Foreman at the Senate hearings, and Carl Foreman had to kind of just be like, "Listen, don't. It's I don't, I don't want you ruining your life for me. It's not gonna go good if you stand up for me. So just I appreciate it, but I, I'll take the hit on this one. I'll go and stand up for myself." You know, which I mean, this movie, like I read a there's there's a there's a book that came out about a year or two ago about the making of this movie. And it it's broken down into like these five parts where each chapter focuses on Carl Foreman, Stanley Kramer, Gary Cooper, Hollywood in general, and then the Red Scare until it all combines into the making of this movie and how Carl Foreman kind of didn't even start it as a movie about the Red Scare. But then once the Red Scare started, he started really really leaning into it but trying to not be ridiculously didactic so people couldn't watch it and just like that's why it like has lasted as long as it has where you could watch it today and feel uh you know weirdly enough rewatching it in the middle of a goddamn pandemic where people aren't wearing their masks going oh yeah people wouldn't do anything if it had nothing to benefit them the 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 car foreman story you just told is interesting right because in the 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 life imitating art in that scenario carl form is will kane right yeah and carrie cooper is that one guy who was willing to go along if there were some other guys along you know what i mean near the end of the movie there's that last guy yeah. who comes in um and gary cooper's eventually like go home right will kane's like go home and that's what yeah. carl Foreman did to him and i think what's interesting about that is reading more about that particular story Part of what Carl Foreman was saying to both Stanley Kramer and Gary Cooper was uh, not just, I'll take the hit for this, but if you come with me, you're going down too, and there's no reason why you need to go down. And I think that there's something interesting about, about looking at it from that perspective too, the perspective of the coward. You know, it's part of why I've always really loved, I know you don't, Mike, but I've always really loved No Country for Old Men. <laughs> because the, the the cowardliness or the cowardice uh, of Tommy Lee Jones at the end of that movie rang so true to me. Um, and I think that there's some, it's, it's not nobility. It's not even relatability. It's just believability in people not following Gary Cooper's character to what seemed like a certain death. Uh, I think that's interesting. But I also, at the end of the movie, when all the townspeople came after he killed all four guys with Grace Kelly's help, I just yelled, 
fuck you guys <laughs> because that's how i felt um, so you know well he, he does it and he, he does it in the classy way of just looking at all of them with that God, stink eye cool. and throwing that badge in the dirt where yeah. it belongs yeah gary cooper i mean gary cooper was also kind of a controversial uh pick for this movie because it wasn't written for an older actor uh gary cooper's career was c- kind of in a big downturn at that point uh, nobody expected anything in this movie because, oh, well, Gary Cooper's got another movie. It's going to be another stinker. You know, this guy doesn't know when to quit. I mean, you know, there's the one element that you could kind of make an uh, argument about. Maybe they should have thought this through is the fact that he's marrying Grace Kelly that, in the movie. That's also that is also of the time. As people, point I don't out. have a problem with that. That's the thing. I don't I don't have a problem with that. I watched it and. I figured, well, that's kind of what happened in the West. And then you read, I read the book and then you just do more research. And it's like, oh, people kind of come up against that plot point. And I go, well, all right. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things. Gary Cooper is, he's the man. That is oh, can I, can I read short. one thing about that plot point? And, I, and then I want to jump on what Kenny was saying about the cowardice. But about that plot point, I do think there's something to that in terms of whether or not, you know, we can apply today's uh, standings on, on, on that type of age gap or anything. There's something about her being so much younger than him because she's not just younger than him. She's a Quaker. They dress her in all white. She is she is pure. She is new. And the main conflict that she faces toward the beginning of that film is Cooper's past entanglement with uh, with uh, Katie Gerardo's character. Right. And that that level of tension there and that level of, of jealousy. But that ultimately itself is symbolic of the fact that no one sticks around for him except for Grace Kelly. She is the one that sort of helps him, which is one of the things that John Wayne pushed back about. And there's something about the fact that she is so young and she's a Quaker. She's so not a part. She hasn't become jaded or cynical yet like the rest of this town. She hasn't become so self-involved that she is the one person who is willing to do the quote unquote right thing and help him. Whereas everybody else who who has you know, who is the more quote unquote mature grown up person. They're just looking out for themselves. They're just trying to get by. And I think that, I think that her being that young does kind of help that moment in the film. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I don't quite as much brush up against that as well as that's what it was at the time, but you know. Oh yeah. No, I mean, and it's also just, adds such a tragic heartbreaking element to the movie of this, this poor girl has to like break her entire moral code to save the man she does like she does actually love him and she has to break this code having watched her family get gunned down because people are just violent <laughs> and it, it's you know I, I when that happened i was like there's no way sam peckinpah doesn't love this shit like just everything's bad people suck you gotta break your code that you can't have a code in this world blah blah it's just it's so tragic and i, I and i don't know i just love that this movie's very willing to just say, yeah, people, you may want to take a stand. It, it's almost funny that it came out 10 years before Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it, that's, it, it's another element that adds to the timeliness of the story. To, to jump on, Kenny, you're, you were discussing the idea of cowardice in the film and the other people. Here. One thing I, I really appreciate about this that's so different is you don't, you can see characters be you know, afraid in movies, and very often that's played as a bad thing, that's played as a criticism. What's fascinating, I think, I don't know if you guys felt this, but Will Kane is afraid the whole movie. They have no problem playing him scared, but they make sure to differentiate that there's a difference between being afraid and being a coward. He's still willing to do the right thing, but they also make it clear that he's he's unnerved by a lot of this. When he runs into the church... And he's asking for help. He's he's unsettled by this. He's not putting on the brave face and being the John Wayne tough guy. He's scared. That's that that is that is why this movie fucking rules. I mean, like, full stop for me. If I, I don't get me wrong, I haven't seen Rio Bravo, but my understanding is John Wayne plays a similar character in a similar story where he never betrays fear, right? Mm-hmm. That coupled with I think the I think that John Wayne was probably uh, upset at the idea that Americans don't band together in the face of, you know, an oncoming threat, which I think we are literally seeing right now um, upset him. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, but it is Gar- It is the fear and ind- an indecision on Gary Cooper's face. Every step of this that sells the movie for me. 
And at one point he admits it, right? To Lloyd Bridges' character. He admits that he's scared. He's literally thinking about running. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he wants him to run and he's thinking, oh yeah, he, th- he, th- he says he's, he's thinking about running, but he pulls back. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then he gets in, he's literally just, yeah, it, it's even in, um, I, I, I can't even think, there's not many Westerns even after this where I could honestly think of many characters, main gunslinging characters that admit and show their fear. And especially for Gary Cooper, you know, it's, he's not too dissimilar in stature at the time, or at least maybe 10 years earlier was kind of Hollywood's John Wayne, the all American boy who, who's always, you know, riding in on his horse. He's, he's the good old boy. And he comes in, he's just like, no, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, I, 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 this is this, I'm looking at everybody I thought was my friend and they're, they're abandoning me and four maniacs are waiting for me. This, this is not going to go well. And something you yeah. said at the beginning, Tom, right in the beginning of the, the podcast about how tight it is and how, you know, you can graph this onto so many other things. You should do this all the time. And, um, you know, uh, how, how no one had ever thought of this before. This is like screenwriting 101. And I don't mean that in like a condescending oh, way, right? Like this is, this is, this is a hero's journey, Joseph Conrad, to the fucking minute. And build up payoff. And the power of it is like what you always see because people are afraid to make their heroes weak in any way is that you an important part of the hero's journey is the reluctant hero, right? Like like saying no initially. But people always say no yeah. because I don't know, they 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 have a family at home or they have a better offer or some other or or they they're retired or some other thing that doesn't make them look weak but to say no because you're afraid and overcome that that's awesome you know that's so powerful tom tom might know when we were in college i had, we had a professor and he i remember he gave me a note once on something i was writing and it stuck with me uh, cause Kenny, I'm sure you've had this when people, uh, so every once in a while, when somebody gives you like writing advice, you end up just processing it as, as spiritual <laughs> philosophical advice. Oh my God. Yeah. It's a little harder. Um, and he was saying that the, one of the big problems we have with, with people who write stories now is that they think that bravery means that you're not afraid when actual bravery is being afraid, being aware that you're afraid and doing it anyway, because it's the right thing. And so often with, you know, characters in films, you're right. They don't show any fear. They don't show any flaw or anything like that. But what sets this film apart from the John Wayne films, and we're going to talk about The Searchers uh, this season on the show, too. And that is its own examination of masculinity and, and courage uh, that, that John Ford uh, is exploring in that. But this film really does get to the heart of that idea of it is, in fact, Courage is knowing the risks, being afraid and overcoming it because you have to and because you you know it's the right thing. And I I think that that I I thought of that a lot watching this again. To go back to that scene where Lloyd Bridges, he gets into the fight with Lloyd Bridges. He almost loses the fight. You know, it's just another thing of like another one of those little perfect writer moments of just he, he if he can't beat Lloyd Bridges in a fist fight, he might not be able to win against yeah. four maniacs with guns coming to get him. And like he, another thing that I love about it is he almost loses the fight and then he spends the rest of the movie because it's in real time, big old bruise oh, that's kind so of bleeding good. on his uh, on his eye. And then if you notice, he, his knuckles are bleeding. He's got scraped up bloody knuckles the rest of the movie. It's just this wet belief, just building up the believability of this world until that moment. Where, and then you finally go, oh, thank God he won. And only because the freaking maniacs are too stupid and they just make too much noise when they're coming to get him it's al- it's almost that simple if he didn't he just got lucky <laughs> i was thinking about and tom you're definitely going to disagree with me me on the films i'm about to evoke but uh i i've been dealing with the fact that uh another podcast that we all are fans of they are now doing commentary uh on the mission impossible movies and i have okay. you know i've watched the mission impossible movies and they do nothing for me. And that's not me saying they're bad. I just get nothing out of them. And I think part of my problem with them 
is the fact that we go into them knowing that Tom Cruise himself is trying to die in the stunts he does, you know? And we hear the stories about how he actually injures himself. But I feel like when you're watching the movie, and it's not just uh, those movies, but I feel like when you're watching it, I never feel Ethan Hunt is in any danger, you know? He is, they they don't really give him a mortality. He is such a, a superhuman. The same way, I never think that Hobbes or Shaw are in any dangers, or Dom Toretto, <laughs> anything. They're, they're all such <laughs> supermen. And I think that it's weird because the mortality that we, the suspense we get out of watching Mission Impossible is not, oh, I don't think Ethan Hunt's going to make it over the train or, you know, off of that plane or whatever. It's the fact that we know, oh, Tom Cruise might have died filming this, but the character is going to survive. We know he's going to survive. The beauty of High Noon and having that fight scene, like you mentioned with Lloyd Bridges, and having him be bloodied and having him hobbling even from the beginning is that they go out of their way to make that character feel so mortal that even though he's the hero of the movie, you still sit there and go, he may die. He may die in this film. And I feel like I, I, you know, people always criticize the Marvel movies for this, like, oh, no one's really dead or anything like that. And of course they came back, but you know, the, the little things of, of enjoying the fact that, yeah, they did kill some characters at some point and some of them will stay dead. You need a, I, I, I love this sense of, oh, this character is mortal. I want that feeling of mortality in my, in my action heroes. For whatever reason, there is a, there is some kind of screen up between me and the mission impossible movies that stop me from engaging with them as I'm watching them. And I've seen, I, I, in fairness, I haven't seen what I think people consider the best. I haven't seen, I think ghost protocol people consider is the best, the best. Uh, I think fallout. I think fallout. At I've this seen point fallout. Been, the, been crowded. I've seen about. that, but I hadn't seen ghost protocol, but again, it's not going to do anything for me. They're, they're all garbage. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, oh, hang on, hang on. I just need to take a moment to acknowledge how exciting it is to me that we got Kenny on the podcast. I've told you we got Kenny on the podcast. You know, Tom's all excited. We're talking about one of Tom's favorites, and he has an opinion that Tom doesn't agree with. It's a delightful moment. <laughs> well, I, a I, know that, here. I know <laughs> that I know that Tom and I have like a long standing date to argue about The Departed, but I'm going to hold off. Well, on that. I, you know, I actually, if you want, Kenny, I got an idea. You know, a couple seasons from now, we're going to have to do ET, which I know is one of Phil's favorite movies, and I despise. So we could just trade off hosts, and you, you and Tom talk Departed, me and Phil talk ET, and it'll just be a bloodbath. Tom, what was the movie you went directly at? Oh, 2001. You guys are cool on Twitter. You guys are cool the way you, <laughs> you take down the cows. I, I love wow. that. <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, if if only i knew you in high school <laughs> like i mean, I mean, I mean look <laughs> obviously it's what i like to do too right like if if there's a movie that that has been for whatever reason you know put up on a, on a shelf by the, the film twitterati or whoever does the shelf putting up on and i think it's trash i love to you know take shots at it but so few people do and both of you guys are willing to do that and that's why i that's why we love like interacting with you guys. Sorry to take us yeah, off topic, I, but you've you, no, you've, please, li that's, you've that's listened fine. to our podcast. I, I rarely stay yeah, on top. No, I just I also I all trust me on the Phillips. It's not going to be going up, but I'm I'm happy to send it to you. There's a 15 minute diatribe between Tom and Phil about the the Lake Placid sequels. So, are you serious? Uh, that that is on the yeah. That, it was a whole discussion. There is a Lake Placid sequel called Lake Placid versus Anaconda. Yeah, it's a, it's the sixth. We we I ordered we just did Lake Placid a couple like last week. So I'm it's all that stuff super fresh in my head. Yeah. No, it's uh listen, we we, we live in the sidebar and um yeah, I, I wish I knew you in high school so somebody would say I was cool. Um Tom, where'd you where did you grow up? Because I knew a lot of people who talked like you. Me? Uh, yeah. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, then I moved to Long Island. So I, I still, I think I, uh, people like to tell me I still have the Brooklyn accent. You guys both grew up in Long Island? Yeah. 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 We're, we're, we grew up maybe, and that's the funny thing when we used to hang out at college or even when we used to work together is that Tom and I grew up maybe 10 minutes away from each other and have two very different accents that no one says sounds like Long Island. So yeah well, always fun long, long, long <laughs> island is the long island thing right and i still even from westchester i can't really say long island like i guess everyone else in the world does i it's, it's long island so lawn guyland guy it's guyland it's long island yeah but, lawn like you're mowing the lawn then guyland yes. where all the guys yes you know where the, la the land of the guys from. 
Yeah. And if you're if you're from Long Island, you know that any time Long Island is trending on Twitter, you have to sigh before you click it because it won't be good. Yeah. Someone it's... someone went to another bagel shop and did something bad. <laughs> Not uh, Trump. Trump. Trump just tweeted about a fucking Long Island pizza place today. Well, I know, I know he tweeted a plug for a Long Island pizza. Well, joint. I know that place is trash. If that that yeah. blithering dipshit likes it. Oh boy. Um, but to, um, just to get to the, <laughs> just to to wrap back around to our original diversion. Um, yeah, we we, we like to just. I genuinely don't like two thousand one. I don't like most of Kubrick's movies. I love Eyes Wide Shut. I love Strange Love. I love Paths of Glory. But I feel like so much of uh, film criticism, film Twitter, film society loves to talk about how, oh, well, we like talking about movies and breaking down and all art, you know, doesn't have to, you know, be one thing. But then when you say something like 2001, I don't like it, they go, what? And I'm like, well, I got my I got my arguments. L- leave me alone. God damn it. Here's here's my thing too, and what we're what we're doing with the show, and what the whole point of this show is, and why I want to make sure you know that we don't just become something that's like all oh, this all sucks. Is what twi- film Twitter has forgotten is there is a difference between saying you don't like something or saying something's not for you and saying it's objectively bad. Yeah, like I would never say 2001 is objectively bad. I just don't like it. Right. I respect it, yeah, and I, I understand its place in history. It's just something I've watched many times in life. I even watched it two years ago. They showed it on 70 at the Alamo. And I'm like, yeah, this is this is quite the experience. It's just bouncing right off me. As some movies do. And, you know, this used to be... God, I sound like an old person. But, like, it did used to be a thing where people held different opinions about different well-regarded yeah. movies. Absolutely. And I... I I just can't help but feel like there is an approved list and a non-approved list. And, you know, we all know it's on it. Mike and I know that the Mission Boss movies are on it, for instance, and you know that 2001 is on it. And then there's some movies that aren't on it. And that's, that's fine, I guess, but it's so lame. Like I could basically, and I love our guests and I love our podcast. Um, but so rarely do I have someone who comes on the podcast that I can't uh, that I can't guess what take they'll have on the movie, and not necessarily because of who they are, just because of what the movie's you know kind of uh, vibe is right now in the culture, and that's and this has nothing to do with this has nothing to do with you know the the kind of right wing bullshit about you know liberal people and cancel people. This has to do with like our people <laughs> like, yeah, like our people like like deciding that there's a, a right way to think and it's a little fucking boring well you know what on that note if something is 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 potentially problematic let's take the time to dig into it and give it its context because when you present something in a montage and you just kind of without getting into why is this bad you know there's a there's a chasm between something that is genuinely truly un, undeniable like we're going to be dealing with birth of a nation in a couple seasons on this show good luck there's no getting around that yeah you don't want to come back for that one no you know well, I, I, I you know what maybe i do not jump on the tw griffith train no, i'll come <laughs> back if you want me but with with like birth of a nation we're gonna have to confront that for what it is and we're gonna have to confront that for the fact that that is made hatefully there is a I, I think that it's a, about drawing that line and that distinction between things that are made with hateful intentions and things that, as a work of art, weren't made with hateful intentions but were taken perhaps in a in By a hateful way, way. That's what I like about what you guys are doing so much. You don't have the ability to pick and choose. Um, you can't say birth of the the birth of a nation is abhorrent. Therefore, we won't do it. Um, you have to do it. It's like all of these blackface sitcoms, sitcoms that use blackface that are just taking it down. That's not what you should be doing. You no. should have to deal with what you did. You should have to deal with it. People should have to confront it. I don't mind the Gone with the Wind thing where they're coming in before and explaining the historical context of it. That's fine. With another me. thing we got to do, and another one we got to do in season well, one. It's gonna be great. Do that soon, but. 
But I love that about this podcast. And, you know, to, to this point, it's a much smaller issue in High Noon, but we, we hit upon it earlier, the Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly relationship that people now are like, well, I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous and it's awful and he's predatory. Well, okay, we can put that to the side now. Like, let's actually discuss the movie, maybe discuss why that was a thing at the time, not only, you know, in the 1800s when this is set, but in 1952 when this was made. Um, what that really meant and why our attitudes have changed. Like, that's what you guys are doing, right? That's the purpose of all art, which is that it's it's a reflection of the society we're living in. Even if it's a movie like High Noon, which is not set in 1952, is a reflection of the times of 1952. And Birth of a Nation was reflective of the times when that movie came out, just like Disclosure is reflective, reflexive of the time that it's coming out, you know, now. And uh, you know, I, I think a lot of this stuff is kind of um, we're losing a lot of media literacy with a lot of people and a lot of people are coming at movies with the sense of if it doesn't reflect my life, then it is an abject failure. And or, or, or what I want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not what I want it to be, if it's not about if I wouldn't do it this way or if it doesn't reflect my life as. Me, I'm a 29 year old white guy on Long Island. Well, this movie's garbage because it's not reflective of my life. Or, you know, somebody's saying that this is not me. It's well, that's not what art is. And it, there's there's a whole can of worms you can get into with that. The thing I'd be interested in, kind of breaking down with with High Noon, in in you know in relation to this question, is. The movie in and of itself, the 84 minutes or whatever, 82 minutes of, of the, the film, you know, titles to titles, is an incredible piece of storytelling, narrative storytelling. So tight, so propulsive. Good guys are good, bad guys are bad. It's a great morality play. Like, if you don't like this movie, I don't really, you are wrong. Objectively speaking, you're a dummy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the, the, it it were it were <laughs> sorry go on, no, I, go didn't on. Be, I, mean, I didn't be I mean, I, that wasn't a long setup for my joke though you know i found my way there but no i was i was gonna say it i've never heard them side by side but it worries me how similar you and tom's i just said something that i may regret laughs are it's, uh, it's, <laughs> um so so but what what so so to kind of answer what i think at least my answer for for you know, the, the question posed by this podcast, why this movie belongs where it belongs or wound up where it wound up is because of what I just said, right? However, there's the other element that, you know, we let off with the uh, anti-McCarthyism stuff, the anti-Red Scare stuff, um, and the, the allegorical stuff that seemingly can be overlaid on everything else. And how much do you think that uh, has buttressed its legacy moving forward? Because not every Western, and not every Western is an allegory to some extent, right? Every movie, every good movie is an allegory to some extent. But every Western is an allegory to some extent, particularly because it's, it, it's almost necessarily about, you know, someone going somewhere and finding something out about themselves. So you can overlay that onto, you know, your own life or politics or whatever. But I, I wonder what today the legacy of this movie is, because I had no idea until watching it, reading about it, that it was a allegory for the red scare. I, if I may, I mean, I, I'll answer that quick because there are, and Tom can touch on this a little more in detail because he knows it better than I do, but I think that it's interesting because it's, without the context of the Red Scare, I think obviously the film still works greatly because I watched as a kid not knowing what the hell that was. Uh, and also in, in Poland, in post-communist Poland, when they were having their first elections, High Noon was used as part of a campaign. It was used as as these sort of... Uh, posters encouraging people to vote and stand up and do the right thing. So obviously they didn't have the red scare, but that still hit a nerve with them. I think that with High Noon, what's so special about this this film is that because it's an allegory, it's the same way 
High Noon is a Western, but it's also very much that Crucible-esque thing where obviously the Crucible is another metaphor for the Red Scare, but it's, you know, uh, they but they both kind of do it in such an intentionally obtuse way that it's not about the Red Scare. It is about the conflict at the heart of this particular historical moment that can feel universal the same way that you know, we, we can always compare, you know, how many times do people compare something to Star Wars and the Empire? Because they, they may be a, about a particular thing. Lucas may have meant the Ewoks to be a metaphor for the Viet Cong or, or what have you. But at the end of the day, they, they hit on a universal truth and something that is always relevant. So I think that relating to a particular moment, it is it is enough of an abstract that people can watch it and and take something personally from it. I mean, you look at obviously Dirty Harry, while while Dirty Harry is a very different character than than Will Kane, clearly they drew from this. I mean, Dirty Harry also ends with him throwing his badge away mm -hmm. uh, in in the face of what he thinks is a flawed system. Now those have two very different vantage points. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, High Noon is a criticism of the cowardice of a town, whereas Dirty Harry seems to be about how how bad the the California law enforcement has has gotten. <laughs> um, which again, I as 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 native New Yorkers and and full time New Yorkers, uh, we don't know anything about that, and we're not gonna touch on that too much. You you are a Californian, so it was, re so, it was you know, you really bad before the Deadpool, then it got a lot better. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think the beauty of High Noon is that. It, it it works without the story around it because it still gets to the heart of the idea of standing up for something you believe in and having to deal with people that let you down. And you, you're right, you know, good guys to the good guys, bad guys to the bad guys. It, it taps into something essential so it can translate. It's the same way that Westerns work in part because they are easy to translate. You can have Akira Kurosawa watch Westerns sure. and go, okay, how do I do that over here for me? Uh, you can have Sergio Leone watch Westerns and go, how do I do that here? Even, I found out recently, there's even a genre, uh, a subgenre of Western that is referred to here in the U.S. as a Borscht Western, which was Mosfilm, the Soviet film company, made their own Westerns that all had uh, communist messages in them. Interesting. Uh, which I have been trying to track down because my, my girlfriend is, is from uh, the Soviet Union, later Russia. That, so to answer your question about whether it, you know, let's, it does, it definitely hits a, hits a nerve. I mean, do sometimes people maybe read themselves into it and maybe miss the point? Yeah, again, apparently it was one of Reagan's favorite films and the guy named names. Um, so it's the born so, in the yeah. USA of uh, Westerns? Yeah, maybe the guy didn't have the best grasp of, of subtext. Kind but... of, right? So like, I think that you're, you're hitting on something though. So there's something here, right? Like the movie is explicitly, explicitly is not the right word, but, but we know through our study of history that Carl Foreman intended for this to be an allegory of something specific. But th there is actually nothing within the body of the movie that speaks, that, 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 that the four guys coming to kill Gary Cooper do not represent the Congress coming to get Carl Foreman, unless you tell me they do, right? So, or unless I'm in the moment and I'm reading into that myself. The universality, the universality of this movie, uh, that's you know so powerful and 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 kind of works to everybody. Is everybody has that moment where they feel like they're the only person standing up against some system. I think that's part of part of of life. Uh, I feel that every day, you know, with my four children. So. I think that it's not crazy that Reagan saw himself in this and that Clinton saw himself in this. I bet Donald Trump, if he understood how to break down a movie or even turn on his television, would would see himself in this. He yeah, absolutely he would, just, he would, would just say he would just say he married the wrong woman. No, I mean I think he would. Like I think this is I think this yeah. is basically you know his 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 daily thing. Like where are you guys for me? Where are you Fox News for me? Where are you Jeff Sessions for me? Like that's he he. I think that's how he views the world. So, and I think that's how a lot of us view the world. Um, so that's interesting to me in, in that respect. What, something that, I, that I'm, I'm kind of like thinking about is, is there, how do you guys feel about the canonization of movies 
that really don't have an allegorical element. Like one I'm thinking of in particular is a movie I actually watched like a couple of days ago, you know, for the millionth time, but I introduced my eight year old to it because I'm such a great father. Uh, was Die Hard, right? <laughs> God, God, you and Tom are the same person. Hey, I, oh, I see, I see, I see a direct line from High Noon to uh, Die Hard. Except he has some allies, but there is yeah. a direct line. But he does, he has some allies. But like, I don't, I do see the direct line, no fucking doubt about it. I mean, to the point where like, you know, he's, they're calling him Roy, but they really should be calling him Will Kane, right? Yeah. So. Uh, he even says, oh, you like Gary Cooper? And he's like, I was, I was more partial to Roy Rogers. Yeah. He, yeah. There's probably two, something to that. But I don't see a lot of allegory in that movie. I see a lot of universality into it, into it right? Yeah. A lot of people have felt like their, ba- their, their backs are against the wall. But that doesn't, I mean, what, what was that, that up against? The, the end of the Cold War? Um, I don't feel that thing at all. But I think it's a masterpiece. Here's, here's where I'll counter. I don't think that, I, I, I'm not going to come out against a film because it's not an allegory. I will come out against a film that has nothing to say. And I think that the important thing is that Die Hard may not be a direct allegory for something, but it does have something to say. It does have points. And I was going to bring up Die Hard. In my notes, I have Die Hard mentioned in part because, you know, we were talking about Reagan watching High Noon and thinking, you know, he's the hero. And that High Noon challenges us not to say that we are Gary Cooper. We can relate to that. But the question of if Gary Cooper called on me, would I stand with him? And I think that I always make a point to Tom uh, about this, that part of my problem with so many movies that I brush off is like tough guy movies or ones, or ones that guys watch and they tell themselves, that'd be me. Uh, you know what? If it came down to it, I'd be Walter White. I'd be you know, John <laughs> McCain. I'd be all that. And I look at Die Hard and I am fully willing to accept, and I have acknowledged this my whole life, I am aware of myself enough to go that if I was in that building, I would not be I would not be John climbing in the in the uh in the air ducts. I would be the guy that goes, Hans, Bubby, I'm your white knight. You'd I'm gonna be try Ellis? to fix this and no, get shot in the fucking no, you face. Be. No, you like, be. no, no, I'm I, I, yeah, no, because I know that <laughs> because I am because I am Hans Bubby. <laughs> because I know I know I know that I do not have the ability and or the courage or anything like that to like get an air duct, but I know that I would try and talk my way out of it. I know that I would be that idiot who misreads the situation and goes, hang on, hang on. I'm pretty sure I can negotiate with this. And I get shot in the fucking face. Like that's about as much courage as I'd show. Me too, by the way. Is like thinking I can talk my way out of it. And I think that when we're talking about, so with Die Hard, because it has that moment, because it has the Hans Bobby moment, because it has, instead of it just being a Steven Seagal movie or a Chuck Norris movie where the terrorists are just terrorists, because it has that idea of Hans Gruber basically going, oh uh, yeah, release these people and we'll do this. And he's robbing them blind. And, and McLean is the only one who kind of sees through that. There's definitely stuff going on in that film. And there's definitely, that film has things to say. It is grappling with some of the complexities of our culture and even grappling with the form of the action movie and what we view as the action movie, because much like we're talking about Will Kane, much like Will Kane, Bruce Willis's character is painfully mortal in this film. And, you know, in Die Hard, he's walking across glass. He is bleeding. And that movie is a deconstruction of the action genre as much as High Noon for its day was a deconstruction of and an examination of the Western genre, which is why I, this is a point I wanted to raise. I find it so interesting that High Noon is now just considered in the canon of Westerns and one of the formative Westerns, when at the time it was a deconstruction of an examination of the Western and, and, and taking the tropes and going, no, we're going to turn this all on its head. And this movie that is subverting the genre is now part of the genre. You're hitting on something so interesting because you, you know, I think Tom, you're the one who said it's the born of the USA of uh, films, right? Yeah. That yeah, obviously happened to West- that obviously happened to that album and that song as well, right? Where where people stopped engaging with what and your 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 argument for Die Hard was really fantastic. People stopped engaging with what with what was actually happening on screen, and just kind of put it into a box that kind of fit it. And that's a little dangerous too. It is funny, you know, what you're talking about with 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 High Noon, that it stands side by side with you know, a 
I don't know, a Shane or a Rio Bravo or, you know, all of these Western, all these Westerns, um, a stagecoach, when it really is nothing like them. And that's why, you know, I've said over and over again, I don't think Western is really a, a genre. But yeah. um, that's, you know, that, that's another point for another time. But, I mean, Western isn't really a genre, but it also is a little... It, it it's missing the point when when I it's 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 not the point I'm not, the point I'm trying I'm not trying to make the point that 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 west that western isn't a designation. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it's it, there's something about westerns that go beyond setting that are interesting, but it's not really a genre. Well, that's like I mean western. I I will say this, and then to agree with you, I'll say that western is as much a genre as noir is a genre. Insofar as it's a it's a skeleton that has certain tropes and cliches that you can either play on or build off of and subvert, but it's not a you know a noir is a type of if you will action or thriller film, same as a western, but they are they they provide a skeleton where you can they give you a series of stock characters, kind of like if you were doing a commedia dell'arte or something like they give you a sequence of stock stock characters that you can use if you want to, then you can either use those as a crutch or you can use those to build off of. But I, I don't believe it's a separate genre in and of itself, no. If that's what you're getting at, I hope I'm not. That's, exa- you know. that, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, I can quibble with the, with the noir part, but yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially a loose set of suggestions um, that can be, as you said, utilized, disregarded, subverted, etc. No, but I, I do want to make some other observations about the film itself. You know, we are we are talking about, you know, the heart of it. But I mean, one thing is we're talking about it just for its theme and just for its story. Right. And that's all we've focused on so far. And I think that's right. And I think there's a lot going on there. But I think that there are movies that we talk about and we talk about it solely because of its story and solely because of uh, you know what it's saying. But let's not take away from the fact that this is also a remarkably constructed film from a technical standpoint. There are multiple shots. I mean, the, the dolly shot when the, the wagon is pulling away from Gary Cooper, where it, it really accentuates the emotion of the moment, the really taut editing. There's a lot of this movie visually, I think, that is really poignant as well and really hits the mark as well. And I want to make sure that for those listening who haven't seen it, they don't think we're just talking about something that's a little more uh, static. There is a lot going on technically. Oh, the, 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 the montage right before the train's about to come in and you just... The, yeah. the music is going and it's cutting to e- like every other beat and just the tensions building. I'm like, this is some of the most modern editing I've seen in a movie. And this is 1952. It's not, it's no surprise that it won best, uh, best editing at the Academy Awards. This movie is unbelievably tight and just, it, it just moves like a locomotive without ever feeling like it's like forgetting to do something. Everything in every, every moment, every cut, every frame is just exactly what you need at, the, at that moment. And it, it just even like the action sequences, I mean, it's you're not going to throw this up against Die Hard or John Wick. But for a 1952 movie, I mean, the fight with Lloyd Bridges is kind of brutal for a 1952 movie. Oh, and yeah, the it shootout, the sh- like, it feels believably messy in a way that a lot of Westerns, I mean, and then hell, even action movies today don't necessarily take the pains to make it feel like, and it's just, it's every, all of these little decisions just add to the timely timelessness of this movie. Like just rewatching it the other day, I'm like 85 minutes. Like there's a lot of movies that are this short back in the fifties, forties, thirties, whatever that you'll watch. And you'll be like, holy shit, get to the point. And this movie just, it's like a bullet right out of the gun. And Whew. you get everything you need from the dialogue, just the way he builds the world, the way people talk to each other or look to each other or how they stand next to each other. Like just that one little prick of a guy who works at the hotel that Helen Ramirez is staying at. You just, you get everything you need to know about that guy just from the way he looks at Grace Kelly or the way he like slyly like sticks the knife in between the ribs of Gary Cooper is saying like, oh yeah, you know what room she's in, right? You go, ah. This perfectly constructed movie. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, you know, a lot of the times it's very helpful, writer or filmmaker, to work within some kind of parameter that either is imposed upon you or you impose upon yourself. And the real time ness 
the 82 minutes until that train comes. I think it's like 80, but whatever, until the train comes, imposes a um, parameter upon this movie that it, it gives it an so, engine. It, well, it gives it an engine for sure. Uh, and it never stops moving, like you said. But one moment I want to highlight that I really love is so for about about 60 minutes, the first 60 minutes, you really have Gary Cooper walking around um, from place to place looking for people to deputize. And he gets a no, and he gets a no, and he goes to a saloon, he goes to the church, and he goes to a friend, and he sends the kid to go get another, an, old, an, older, de- an older sheriff. And he fails, and he fails, and he fails, and he fails. And he goes back to his office and he still has 20 minutes. And there's that moment where it just feels like he's played every card and he sits with himself for a moment. That's the most tense moment in the movie for me. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's yeah. like you're, you're going and you're going and you're going and you've run out and you know the clock is still ticking over his corner and you know it's going to be one on four at that point and you are you you are just sitting with him and feeling like the world's about to end cuz i again it's 1952 and i know that this is a bit of a subversive western going into it i think this guy might die right yeah. for real and i desperately did not want him to die um and we can get into the the, the climactic fight at the end but that was staged and choreographed in such a way that you actually could believe this guy could take them all down with the help of Grace Kelly. But it was really, really awesome. Yeah, they spend the entire time building up. He just, he has, he doesn't win the entire movie until he wins the gunfight, pretty much. Every time he's just getting knocked on his ass, spiritually just getting just a knife in his heart. Everybody he thought was his friend. Everybody who, r- during the wedding, oh, you're the best. We love you. We're so sad to see you go. Then he goes into the church, and you got the mayor giving this big speech. He's the best sheriff we've ever had, the best marshal we've ever had, blah, blah, blah. But business is coming. And what would they think if there was a shootout? Will, you got to go. You, you, business is too important to, to help you out. And just every single moment, he just keeps getting kicked in the teeth. And it's just, you go, well, there's no other option. He keeps losing. He's going to die. Yeah, and it's a tra- uh, you think it's a tragic story. And, 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 it, and it still even is because he still has to leave that town knowing he spent all his time there with people that really weren't there for him. He put his life on the line for people that couldn't care less if he lived or died because, well, our bar used to get a lot more business when uh, Frank Miller was back in town which is a, a name that's funny to have now with, you know, the comics writer. I, I do want to say, by the way, uh, real quick, one thing about this movie being so canonized and being so lifted from is, Tom, when you mentioned the church, yeah. did anybody else have the problem? When there's the church plea and the townspeople arguing, did anybody else think of that moment of, listen to that, pure, authentic country, country gibberish? Uh, I'm glad the kids were here to hear that from no, the, the blazing saddles moment no, that lifts it no there is one moment there is one thing in this movie that always makes me think of blazing saddles and it's the song oh yes well we'll get into the song yeah. but uh you know but um i'm sorry did you have something to say yeah, the other thing i that. wanted to kind of highlight you hit it on this earlier with the lloyd bridges fight but most action movies and die hard is not one of them but most action movies have your hero kick the shit out of somebody early on to prove their hero bona fides. And yep. when you do that, you have to come back with an even bigger and even scarier villain. I mean, look, Iron Man did it, right? Iron Man got to the point where you're like, who could possibly possibly beat Iron Man? Oh, a bigger Iron Man maybe. Right? <laughs> yep. Like maybe maybe a bigger Iron Man can beat him. Possibly, who the fuck knows. And then you're on some like, I mean, why does the smaller Iron Man even win? I guess some fucking human spirit shit. I don't know. Um, nothing against Iron Man. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, uh, excuse me. He won because he won because much like this film, his best gal was there to help him. So that's all I'm saying. Good point. His, you know, his best gal was, was there to help him. Love survive. Lo- love <laughs> love won the day. But you don't have to do that thing where you 
give your hero tough guy hero bona fides early on in the movie. In fact, it helps everything if you make him somebody who can barely beat up Lloyd Bridges in a fight. So I think, uh, I mean, I, I really loved that about the movie. I never heard he was a great shot. I never heard he was a war hero. I never, all I heard was that he was a competent sheriff. That was it. Who could arrest a murderer. And even then, they make reference to the fact when he goes to the bar uh, that the last time they rounded up Frank Miller, he had more deputies. So they were, the townspeople were more comfortable with helping him. So this isn't even a case of, well, he was a tough gunslinging guy who could take down the bad guys when he was a little younger and sprighter. No, he, he was still just a guy who needed deputies and needed other people to help him to stop this absolute madman. He was a good bureaucrat. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a marshal. He had, he had his boys to help him and just, just all these little, just the way, the little details of the dialogue, he builds up this world and the backstory. Even for 1952, it subverts things that maybe weren't even a thing then, but feel like a thing now. Like the fact that Frank Miller isn't coming back to kill him because he took Helen Ramirez from him. No, he's coming back to kill him just because you arrested me. I don't give a shit about Helen Ramirez. Revenge. Yeah, and even Gary Cooper is just, well, no, I do love my wife. Yeah, I haven't seen Helen in a year. Just all these little things where it could have been soapy or melodramatic. No, it just skips all that and gets right to the heart of it of, this guy just doesn't want to die. And Frank Miller's just a maniac that's coming to kill him. And everyone's a coward. He says let's, says to Grace Kelly at some point, if we leave, he's going to find us there. He's going to ruin our story. He's going to ruin our lives. Like, he has to take care of this now. Huh, just, just. God, God damn it, guys! What what a, what a movie! I like to bring this up when we have a film that had some some Oscar uh, success. I want to acknowledge it, so I want to talk about what ha- High Noon's reception was at the Oscars. As Tom mentioned earlier, it won Best Editing, it won Best Score, it won Best uh, Color cin- uh, Black and White Cinematography, not color. It won Best Black and White Cinematography. It won so it won Best Actor. It won Best Song for the song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, which was performed by Tex Ritter, father of Three's Company's John Ritter. But it also lost some things. It lost Best Original Screenplay, or Best Screenplay, it was called at the time. Lost Best Screenplay to The Bad and the Beautiful. It lost Best Director to John Ford, the famous Western director. But it lost Best Director to John Ford, who did not direct a Western. He lost to John Ford for The Quiet Man, which is the movie uh, about John Wayne going to Ireland, which I don't know if either of you guys have seen The Quiet Man. I kind, I kind of love it. It's, it's just, it's a dumb, goofy movie about how Irish people like to fight, so it connects to me. Uh, but most notably, High Noon lost Best Picture. It was nominated alongside The Quiet Man, Ivanhoe, Moulin Rouge, and the winner, The Greatest Show on Earth, the Cecil B. DeMille three-hour circus movie that I can say, having watched them all, is truly the worst Best Picture winner of all time. And there was, it was one of the most controversial things because everybody thought that High Noon was going to take that award. But there was a lot, but people have speculated that because of its connections to the Red Scare and connections to the McCarthy era, uh, they ended up giving it to Cecil B. DeMille, who was an advocate for blacklisting uh, for Greatest Show on Earth. How about this little fun little number about the Oscars? As a way, uh, Gary Cooper won Best Actor, but he wasn't present at the award ceremony. So who accepted on his behalf? John Wayne. That must have been yep. uh, a nice little uh, moment for John Wayne to accept the award for a movie he fucking hated. It sounds like he was gracious. You you guys read that right? It yeah. sounds like he was he was he was gracious and uh, you know made a joke about how he's going to fire his agent and his business manager for not getting him that role. Um, but yeah, you know, John Wayne was a, was a, a showman and a fraud and a piece of shit. But, um, you know, part of I've, <laughs> something I've always found interesting is as, as important a, a kind of cinematic genre or distinction or whatever Westerns are, Westerns have had almost no success at the Oscars in terms of best picture. Um, Cimarron might be a Western. It's Western-ish. And then you had a couple in the 90s. You had Dancers with Wolves and Unforgiven. You couldn't imagine two Westerns that are more different. But the thing I find interesting is Westerns, as I said, so important to Hollywood. They're so important to Hollywood that 
there are several ranches in and around Hollywood that are dedicated to just shooting Westerns. There are several towns up that just exist to shoot Westerns that have been like that for, you know, 70 years. It's why when Robert Zemeckis wants to make a cheap version of a cheap Back to the Future 3, but also look great, he can just go to a back lot where they've already set up 90% of the production just being there all together. So I wonder why, and I have a little theory, but I wonder why it wasn't more lauded, why Westerns weren't more lauded throughout the Oscars history. I... I, I want to, I mean, I'll, I'll flip my theory and then Tom, maybe we'll go, but I, I think part of it is that I often, there are a lot of people today, uh, or people even from the previous generation, guys who, who taught Tom and I when we went to college, who talk about, who lament the death of the Western, right? Who lament the fact that the Western died out. And these are the same people who write their pieces uh, about how there's too many superhero movies. And there's too many comic movies and all that. But if you go back and you look at some of the contemporary commentary on westerns the critics at the time are saying something similar about westerns that they're movies for kids that they're good guys and bad guys they're not complex enough then that there's way too goddamn many of them because yes we still have high noon in the searches we talk about that but there's so many westerns from the 30s and 40s just so goddamn many um that i can understand people being like oh there's you know that's flooding the cinemas and i think it's interesting that now we're going back and we're honoring the we're we're respecting the western more and i think part of that might be the same thing as noir noir initially you know was just this small swath of films from like the you know the the 30s and 40s that did okay and then and then fell out of fashion and we kind of stopped giving a shit here in the states and then the guys at Calle du Cinema in France took these films and saw something in them and ran with them and started doing, you know, obviously uh, Melville and Godard and Truffaut are all doing their version of noir film. And then it comes back here and suddenly we're like, ah, the noir, the great American art form. And I think with the Western, it had fallen out of fashion in favor of, of, in, you know, in critical circles, it was, oh, these aren't deep enough. There's not enough going on in them. They're, they're, they're kid stuff. And, you know, in the popular culture, obviously, the spaceman ends up taking over Toy Story as a metaphor for that period in cinema and that period in pop culture. Once it goes over to Europe and suddenly you start getting these spaghetti westerns that subvert the genre and everything, and we're able to see what other people are doing with our toys, uh, suddenly it becomes again, ah, the great genre that we... And, you know, obviously, then Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven are movies that are eulogies to the genre of the western. And they get lauded, but then people start making westerns again. You start getting a three ten to Yuma, and no one goes to see it, and no one gives a shit. Well, I would. The only thing I would, the only thing, the the only quibble I would have with that is, audience didn't give a shit. But in the nineties and two thousands, westerns were about as as highly regarded genre as you can get. Like three ten to Yuma was a beloved film among critics, right? And above, and in, in, in film circles, and I think that extended to a lot of westerns um, of the peer, you know, of these, you know, of uh, these last thirty years. You know, you go to like uh, Assassination of Jesse James was a really beloved movie, and you Hell or High Water, a modern western, was nominated. And you know, I don't even know if it's a particularly great example and things like that. So everything you said, I agree with. That's more or less what I was what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I well, think it's. I'm, the populist thing it's in, it's in, there's an embarrassment right yeah just like right now there's an embarrassment about the fact that we make our money you know with superhero movies and in the 70s and 80s there was an embarrassment to the fact that we made our money with you know the spaceman movies to some extent and now there's you know the more elevated version of that as well i mean it kind of started with solaris but you you know movies like gravity are are uh, a more elevated version of that too so i guess in you know 20 years we'll have like some really elevated version of a superhero movie that I went back. Well, I guess we don't like it, but we already have that to a degree, which is, you know, the reason Joker got the reception it did is the fact that it plays it at, uh, at was it Venice, right? Was it Venice that won the award? Yeah, plays it Venice, and the critics are all going, oh, this is it. This is the elevated version of this movie. Uh, and I have my own, you know, who who the hell knows? Maybe in in um in in a decade, the Joker will wind up in the National Film Registry, and we're talking about it on this show. Oh. Who knows? But, <laughs> no. Well, no, I don't want to be so dismissive. Here's my here's my thing with that one, and I'll say this: what I what I do find fascinating about the reception of that movie is that it's almost like we were we're talking about the westerns, and we're talking about how 
uh, the Italians look, took the Western and saw it as this microcosm and stripped it for parts and made something that, you know, no one is going to mistake the good, the bad, and the ugly for an American Western at the time. And certainly no one is going to say that Le Du Luce or Band of Outsiders is an American noir film. What I find fascinating about something like, for example, Joker is that the reception from critics that weren't American was very different than the reception for critics that were. And I, I think a lot about the fact that that movie is an over, over simplification of what is going on in America and what America is about. To the point where we look at it, it's, it's cartoonish and amateurish. But I often think about the fact that there are a good amount of foreign films, particularly Asian cinema, that comes here and does well in the U.S. that people in those countries look at and go, oh, we don't give a shit about this. What are you talking about? Like It's so oversimplified it's so and i i do kind of feel that way looking at that film and that that, that how it plays abroad is pretty interesting because it 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 the oversimplified versions of what's going on in this country seem to play better abroad the same way that oversimplified versions of what's going on in a foreign country play better there you know we don't really get a lot of movies yeah the you know your your every point everything you're making makes um a lot of sense the one that really comes to mind in terms of that again not made by an american but kind of an american movie and it's certainly about america was three billboards which i think is a total piece of trash and <laughs> seemed to be oh, yes and seemed to be just got him <laughs> who loves it who hates it i do not care for that motion picture i think it's pretty good i <laughs> <laughs> and uh and it was you know beloved by foreign critics and foreign audiences and it swept the Golden Globes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's an oversimplification of what's happening in America. And I also think, just like Joker, read a certain way, it's meant to appeal to people who think America is simple. And I don't think America is simple, right? Like, I don't think America is great. I think that's kind of been proven. But I don't think it's simple what's going on here. I was a movie that was beloved in 2018. Uh, a movie that almost won Best Picture in 2018 uh, was Roma, and you you had to work real fucking hard. Uh, you know, I'm I'm you're out in California. I'm in uh, we're in Brooklyn. You had to work real fucking hard to find somebody who didn't like that film or had problems with that film. But I have a friend who is Mexican. It was like you know born and raised in Mexico, living, and she was like, I fucking don't get that. Is such a ridiculously condescending movie. And that it that it really plays into this idea, these things that they really turned. I didn't care for it to begin with, but like it really turned me around on the idea of like it is just playing into these oversimplified ideas of, you know, how how basically this this picture of a crumbling country, uh, you know, in economic strife and that the poor people in it are just dumb, simple idiots and the rich people are too uh, caught up in their own bullshit to understand the simple beauty of life. And. I thought that was interesting that here we look at that and we're like, what a beautiful depiction of this country. And she's like, that's such a crass oversimplification of my, my, my home. And I, I, I find that interesting how things like that. I mean, for this podcast, we're only going to be talking about American films uh, because that's all that gets put in the national film registry, obviously. But I'm so fascinated by the way that these films, whether or not they have life elsewhere as well. And, and what that reflection is, you know, like, I, I just, and, and to be clear, none of this is a defense of, of Joker or anything, but I do find it, I find that interesting, you know, and, and so I think that, for example, you know, we're talking about High Noon, I, I mentioned before, Tom, you might know more about this, but I invoked it before, but like High Noon pl had a role to play in the democratic revolution in Poland. Oh boy, some of the t details are kind of, if, if I'm going to be broad, it's mainly that they were trying to use at the imagery of High Noon as a way to get the the people elected that the government kind of wanted to get elected, kind of using it in a sort of like, sh I don't know, straw man way. But then the people were like, absolutely not. High Noon is not about that. It's about standing up for what's right. And we're going to use the imagery of High Noon to actually be a democratically elected country. And it's that simplicity of the allegory that allows it to be as a... Uh, Timeless, as we said, uh, being able to cross uh, so many bridges and so many countries and societies and all that stuff that, uh, you know, High Noon can, you know, help countries become democratically elected before, you know, enough time has passed and uh, 
everyone's gonna die because the country's the world's on fire and nobody wants to breathe into masks yeah can this country can it help this country be a democratic country well, I actually, on a serious note, Tom, I'm gonna I'm gonna build on what you said. I I think that the big issue we have, maybe as a country, with this film, and with most films, and we were talking about this earlier with the way that people analyze movies, is that there are too many people who watch this movie and think of it as I have been Gary Cooper, and thinking of all the times that nobody stood by me. Whereas what you need to do with this movie is watch it and go, when have I been Lloyd Bridges? When have I been one of the townspeople? And it's like why I mentioned Die Hard before. Like, you've got to watch Die Hard and make peace with the fact that you would not be uh, John, John McClane. It's the same way, like, I, I think that you, are, you, you will be able to do a lot more work on yourself as a person if when you watch Mad Men, you recognize that you're more likely to be Pete Campbell than Don Draper. Like, you can make a lot more progress on yourself and, 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 and personal growth when you understand that that's more the person that you may be. A movie like High Noon challenges you the same way that, again, we're going to talk about it later, but The Searchers challenges you to kind of say, hey, if that's the kind of person I model myself after, Joe, and look, he's alone. Or we talked about it when Phil was on. We were talking about Sunset Boulevard, right? You've seen, have you seen Sun Sunset, Sunset Boulevard? Sunset Boulevard, yeah. So here's, here's, here's the thing I brought up is that uh, we did the whole thing and all of us, we all agreed like how, A, you know, the movie is such a great depiction of how we chew up and, and use people and also how tragic it was that Gloria Swanson couldn't get any work after or couldn't get any really good work after Sunset Boulevard. She makes this amazing performance and the people who went to see that movie missed the point, right? That they went and they watched it and go, oh, how terrible how we treat these celebrities and we chew them up and we use them. How terrible those people are. Not me, but those people didn't recognize this talent and then they wouldn't cast her in shit anyway and when we finished talking about that i wrapped it up by saying all right who here has seen any other gloria swanson movie and i was able to name one tangentially and and, and phil hadn't tom hadn't and most people who watch this and watch sunset boulevard will watch it and be like god it's so terrible that these people didn't appreciate this talent and just let her rot and then not do any of the actual work themselves and actually go hey you know why don't i check out more of this person's work or why don't i look into some of these people who are still alive now and you know so it, it there's that kind of disconnect and i think with with high noon it could help us be a better democracy if we were able to get over that disconnect and accept no i'm not gary cooper i'm the guy that runs out or i'm the guy that says there's business coming to town. all true and as you're speaking i'm you know a lot of thoughts are running through my head one of them is this movie is 70 years old and it's still relevant which is very sad Right. As is yep. uh, Sunset Boulevard and as are almost every movie and play and book that deals with how selfish we all are. Right. Ultimately, that's what we're talking about. However, what's happened in the last two months? On one side, you have these fucking assholes who won't wear masks. On the other side, you have moms and vets and people who are standing up to fucking the Gestapo for other people. For people of color and for other marginalized people uh, who are willing to be like those townspeople. Now, granted, there's, you know, there's, there's safety numbers. It's, soci it's, 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 socially, um, it's socially acceptable or even socially desirable now to be part of these movements. But there's no denying that the danger is real. We've all seen the, you know, the pictures of the moms with, you know, welts on their faces and backs and whatnot. Change is incremental, right? And we've taken steps back, you know, I mean, my mother used to, uh, my mother went to Ohio State in the 60s and was out there protesting and easily could have been someone who was shot at Kent State. Like, it's just, you know, they're, they're, therefore by the grace of God. So there were people who were doing that kind of stuff, but we've taken great steps back. But I think like what's happened now in the face of a bunch of fucking pieces of shit for showing you just how depraved some of humanity is, there's so many people. And it seems like a lot more who are willing to be, you know, the characters who don't exist in, in this movie, who are willing to be Argyle, or who are willing to be, you know, uh, <laughs> Reginald Vell Johnson um, and help out just a little bit. I think that part of it, too, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bit of a kind of broad collective statement, even though uh, we're all in very different levels. This movie, High Noon, gets to the heart of why we tell stories. And again, I say we tend to you've you've written on many shows and I, I I had one failed pilot. So, you know, hey, you know, we all have different things. But but we, why we tell stories is because I, I think about Stanley Kramer and the fact that Stanley Kramer went on uh, to do Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is a movie that is in that weird class of like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, 
Kramer versus Kramer, China Syndrome. They were very big in their moment about a very particular societal issue. And then society maybe didn't always solve the issue, but at least got a to you know, kind of came around on it to the point where like, now there's no urgency to the movie Kramer versus Kramer. You know, there's no urgency to the China syndrome because the issues they wanted to bring light to, these big social issues they wanted to bring light to, they brought light to. And people changed their attitude to a degree. And that was it. High Noon is not a movie about social change. Nor is Sunset Boulevard. These are not movies that are asking the world to change or asking us to push for one big change that'll solve everything. And it's the same way, like, look, we're talking about the state of the world now and, and part of the conflict we see. If you go out, you know, in 2016, I was out canvassing and you just saw how many people just used a phrase. I just want change or I just want this. Oh, this person will fix all of it. This person, if I do this one thing, if I go into this booth and I push this one button, everything's fixed. And the challenges, the things that things like High Noon ask us to confront are not a big social change. They're not a thing that we can do one thing or do one big protest and solve the problem. The stories that you want to tell are the ones that stick with somebody and help them make the little decisions every day that make the world better. High Noon is not about one moment where you got to stand up. It's not about, you know, to say, you know, to invoke the Avengers or anything like this one moment where you've got to stop this bomb and then everything's good. It's about how every day you have to make sure that you are a person who would stand by Will Kane. You have to make those decisions every day. And these kind of stories are what hopefully stick with people and make them make those little choices every day. And I think that's what gives something like this staying power. Is this the best movie you guys? Is this your, I mean, I don't know if you guys do this so we can pretend we don't, or you can take it off. Is this your favorite movie of this batch? Uh, are you talking of all the films we're going to do this season or just of the ones we've done so far? No, of the batch uh, of the, uh, you can obviously, it's your podcast, so do what you want to do, but I'm interested. <laughs> um, of the batch of the first, the first class, or, what are the movies you're excited about? What are the movies that, because talking more and more about it, you know, one of my favorite parts of, of podcasts in general are, are honest people who are willing to kind of change their opinion. And I mean, i came out of this movie thinking it was incredible and now I just think it's transcendent. So what, what do you guys, uh, what, what is, where does this rank for you or, or, or how do you feel about this versus the other one? It's tough. Cause this is a very diverse class. And one of the, one of the rules that Tom and I have kind of set for ourselves with this show is during this kind of, you know, and not right now, obviously we'll change it, but like during the body portion, we try and go out of our way to, to not do like a, I thought it sucked or anything like that, you know, to make sure we keep it objective. But I, there's a lot of diverse things. Like, I love High Noon. It was my favorite Western for a very long time. But then you've got Singing in the Rain is in here, you know, and, and I, that means so much to me. And I'll tell you a movie that I came around on. Uh, you know, I watched we all I think all of us watched that are talking here watched Wizard of Oz when we were kids. Right. Yeah. We all watched it. We watched it so young that it's all obvious to us. Right. Like it's just it's second nature. You know, it's so so ingrained in us. Um, but my, my girlfriend, uh, never saw it. They didn't get it in, in, uh, in Russia. They didn't, you know, or they did like, she didn't have access to it and growing up, she didn't see it. So I watched it with her for the first time and to get to watch that movie through her eyes. And I, maybe it's similar to stuff you've had, Kenny, I'm sure when you've watched stuff with your kids, you know, I'm sure that helps you see it through a, a different lens and maybe kind of reawaken something where you go, man. You know, this is great. So, like, you look at something like Wizard of Oz, and like, this is so perfectly constructed. It sh it didn't have to be this good, and it was. So there's a lot, you know, especially with this class, there's uh, so many things in so many different directions that I don't know if I could sit down and, and necessarily say, you know, High Noon versus Singing in the Rain, you know, I could, if I could do that equation. You know, they, they mean such different things. Well, I could. Those <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. I just want to just want to talk to those two movies real fast. Those are, you know, movies I've seen recently. Wizard of Oz I've watched thousands of times and like literally a dozen since my kids have been born. Um and it's a perfect little miracle. Like it's an, it's a, it's a miracle. And Singing in the Rain uh is spectacular. It's just it's just gorgeous. But I think High Noon is more important. But whatever. It is what it is. Tom, you do it. I've seen most of the movies here. There's, there's some, I gotta, I'm gonna rewatch all of them. 
Uh, there's a few blind spots, mainly like Sunrise. I haven't seen or you haven't seen Intolerance. I haven't seen Intolerance. There's a six, no world. But there's no world where you went out of your way for a four-hour D.W. Griffith film. Listen, don't kink shame me. Um, <laughs> I, I I do got to say that I, it, looking at all this list, I think High Noon is just so like far and away the best thing here in in my eyes of just like. Yeah, listen, Best Years of Our Lives, great. Casablanca, great. Citizen Kane, another great movie with a guy named Kane. I, I, High Noon is just a movie that I'm kind of pissed I didn't see earlier in my life because in the last year it's become so fundamentally just like an important movie in my brain. Like I've literally just ingested this movie, love it so much. And listen, you rank these movies, they're going to be, it's going to be a tough ranking, but I think this is number one with a bullet for me. And there's something about High Noon that's so particularly frustrating as a writer because I never in a million years am going to write Wizard of Oz or Singing in the Rain. But you do look at High Noon and you think, I could do that, right? You're like, yeah. I, 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 can, I, can, I can grasp that. Yeah, it's probably the hardest thing to write something that uh, seems so deceptively simple and, and within reach. But um, that's that's part of the reason why I'm just, you know, so flabbergasted by, you know, like uh, like Fargo, where right? I think Fargo is my favorite movie. But my it, it, part of it is just because of like it's like a fucking EKG out of control, if that makes any sense. Like, I just can't believe how high every moment rises and then comes back down and how high every moment rises. And I feel like I feel that about this movie too, where you don't necessarily go in expecting such transcendence, every fucking scene, but it's there now. And I want to note, you know, Tom mentioned that uh, citizen Kane, another great movie involving Kane. You also, I think are going to get to cover a movie with someone named Kane on your podcast soon. Right. Cause aren't you guys going to have to do beyond the mat at some point? <laughs> 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 Welcome to my wheelhouse. Uh, uh, let's see, ninety nine. Yes, I'm, Kane was a part of WWE in ninety nine. Yes. Oh well, yes. He was. was was do you guys know? One of you is going to know offhand. Was the Mankind uh, Undertaker Hell in a Cell match in ninety nine, or was that a different? I, I think that was ninety eight. Oh, Correct. what was it? Fuck. Yes, ninety eight. Yeah, it was fuck. I there are there are. There are a few things I, I feel bad. It's not like we're picking on him, but he's he's not here. Um, there are a few things I've been looking forward to in terms of like things to just watch Phil grapple with on your show. One of them is the names of Pokemon, which we're doing oh, tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm very excited. Uh, I just want to hear him read Jigglypuff and Charizard uh, with <laughs> as much distaste as possible. <laughs> I I will say just for Kyle and Tom, just so you know, I've gotten two different receptions to Pokemon from these two gentlemen. Kenny has repeatedly asked me, like, why is the cat talking? Who is this guy? So on and so forth. The only feedback I've gotten from Phil thus far about Pokemon is he sent an email back going, this was insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't wait. So tomorrow's, tomorrow's going to be fun. But, uh, it's going to be great. The, but, um, but yeah. I, I, which is, I have to go off on now. Like, yes, uh, please. Beyond the Mat, um, he'll be fine with. It's a film. You know, and like, you know. I just... I, I just wanted, I was hoping so much, I wanted to hear his reaction to mankind getting slammed into the thumbtack. Here's the thing about the Hell in the Cell match. It's the best. There's, I was going to say, there's a certain beauty to it, right? And there's a, there's a certain beauty to it, and I think you could even show a non-fan the Hell in the Cell match, and they'd kind of get what's going on, particularly if like a crazy person like Tom or myself were like giving commentary on why this is so amazing. <laughs> um, what I'm probably going to wind up showing him, because I think I have one shot, and I'm not going to give him four hours of WrestleMania, is uh, <laughs> I, I, I will probably wind up showing him uh, the main event of that year's WrestleMania, which was the first Steve Austin and The Rock match. You know, because oh he, he can at least sink his teeth into The Rock, and we can talk about The Rock. and that, But that match has... McMahon elements to it and just crazy shit that like it's just so inexplicable to someone who doesn't watch I, I mean doesn't that match have like Linda I think it has Linda McMahon kicking someone in the balls like there's crazy shit that he will do he, his brain will actually explode now if I can get him to watch that whole Wrestlemania that Wrestlemania is fucking insane 
that has like one of the TLC matches. I think the first one, like the the stuff they do with women, is just like you 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 can't you can't. I mean, I don't want anyone to know that I've ever seen it. It's like watching it's it's, it's, it's like watching tentacle porn. It's so embarrassing. So, uh, yes, when when I when I feel like Phil can handle it, and probably after the pandemic, so I could sit with him and do some explaining. I will make him watch some wrestling match from start to finish. Listen, when when Phil was on here and we were wrapping up, you know, he he made mention of, you know, he he threw to Tom like, "Hey, you know, if you ever wanted to come on like what's something you'd want to do?" And I just want to throw out there, you know, if if you if you don't end up having a a guest for for uh Beyond the Mat or WrestleMania, I'm pretty sure Tom could make himself available with his expertise. Tom, if if you want to if you want to come on for uh for Beyond the Mat, I'll I'll put that invite out right now. Oh, I would a hundred percent love to talk some wrestling with yeah. not just Kenneth Nybart, but one Philip Iskove Esquire. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. So that's great. We'll do that, Tom. We'll set that up. And Mike, we got Absolutely you tomorrow. perfect. Uh it's gonna be something. You know, you know the 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 one thing I said to Phil was I hope Mike is prepared to carry this whole podcast. <laughs> oh, is he prepared? Motherfucker. Motherfucker, you have no idea. I've watched all 24 of these goddamn movies now. Okay? I got pages of notes. But anyway, I digress. There's a, there, we'll, we'll get it. I, I'm, I'm extremely excited for it. I'm going to go. I, I, my son does have like the, the Pokemon dictionary with all the Pokemon characters or Pokemon encyclopedia, so I'm going to go bone up on that right now. Are your are so your kids are how many your kids are into Pokemon though? So Still? my you know I have an eight year old eight year old twins boy girl a three year old and a one year old so the three year old and the one year old uh, don't do this stuff. Uh, Rollins the, the eight year old was like crazy about it um, from about six to maybe like five to seven, and then uh, and then he grew out of it like you know you're supposed to. But um, I mean, I mean, no shade. I throw no shade as, no. as a grown-up wrestling fan. Believe me, listen. I, I have listen, great respect I, for people who, who stick with something like this. I'll tell you the God's honest truth. I was not. It's not like I really, really kept up with it. It's the fact that you. St- I kept thinking about how miserable you guys would probably be during this movie. So I used to make jokes about it on Twitter, you know, a lot. Like, oh, well, you're gonna have to do this though. You're gonna have to do this. And then when you said you should come on and do it. I felt the fucking pressure and I went out and I, I, I didn't, I didn't own any of this shit. Like I had some of the old games, but that's it. But like the day you said that I was on the Long Island railroad. And when I got off at Atlantic terminal, walked right into that Best Buy and bought the fucking three movie oh, steel book. And I'm just like, I was like, I need to, I need to come on and know my shit. You know, I've been watching this deranged maniacs letterbox for the last week <laughs> of every Pokemon movie. Just going, dude, you have to stop. <laughs> Your mind is going to be mush. I am. I am. I am truly honored. Uh, I actually. I, really I there is a message from Tom that just says you don't have to do this. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> well, I mean, was it always? Was it always Pokemon we were going to have you on for? I felt like there was something else. It was always Pokemon. Um, because I, re- I truly, and I told Phil that's the one I want to do because I'm like, I, I love your show. Because what's fun about it is because it's the year 1999, it was a year that I was alive for. It was a year that I was aware of some things that were going on, but I was eight or nine years old. So a lot of the things you're describing are telling me about a, something from a time that I was there for, but I just meant nothing to me. You know, Magnolia it didn't mean shit to a nine-year-old, you know? These things don't matter to me. But... I, I felt like, you know, with Pokemon, I've got to kind of do the reverse where I got to kind of come in and be like, all right, you guys were in college. You were all hip and cool, but boots on the ground. Let's talk about how this was the biggest, is still the biggest media franchise in the world. It's critically important that we do Pokemon. I'm not just saying that. Like, it's critically important if we are actually going to, like, we don't, like, like, you guys don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to pick and choose. Like, we, we're going to have to do the other sister. So it's like, it's, it, like we're, we're, I guess, no, we're just we we have to do this. We have to acknowledge that this fucking weird ass movie was number one at the box office. Is that right? Oh yeah. Not only not like, only that, it was the highest grossing animated film of 1999 until like a week later when Toy Story two came out. Right. Like this stuff matters. Like and you, like I you, said, it's feel- erasure if you don't do it. I'm doing this research because to me, and we'll, we'll circle back and we'll wrap up high noon in a sec, but um, I, I'm to me, what we're going to do and why I have so many notes is 
this episode, it's a 70 minute movie. This episode isn't going to be just talking about the Pokemon movie. It's let's talk about the phenomenon that this was at this time and how it, the first game only came out in 1998. And by 1999, it is the most dominant cultural force. They are painting these fucking characters on Boeing 747s, and the Vatican has to issue a statement about whether Pokemon is safe for children. Like, that's how fucking big this got in a year. I think you're approaching this the exact right way, because if I were a, a listener of the podcast, what I would be hoping for was an education. What is this fucking thing? Why did it get so big? And, like, why, like, two years ago, is everyone chasing Pokemons outside? So um there's a lot of shit that we can get into uh but yeah again you're gonna have to be you're, you're well, gonna have to be in the captain seat that's well, the only the only thing with pokemon i can add to this conversation was when it was at its peak and i was eight years old my teacher took my pokemon cards in class because i wouldn't stop playing with them and then when she left the room for a second i went i broke into her desk stole my cards back and she immediately knew what i did and i was in big trouble <laughs> anything for a pokemon you gotta catch them all well, that's just that's just me. I was a little uh, Pokemon freak breaking into rooms and stealing okay. shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's all I can have for Pokemon discussion. But Gary Cooper, why can't yes. people... Oh, to tie it back <laughs> into 1999. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? Tony Soprano. Hey, oh, yeah. There you go. Was that a 99 episode? Yeah. Which episode was that? That was the was pilot the- when he goes to, to, to it- Melfi. Oh, th- oh, oh, it was a line. Oh, whatever happened to Gary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? So, Kenny, thank you so much for, for joining us for this. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm really glad you hadn't seen this film before, and I'm glad that uh, it really worked for you. Uh, I'm very happy yeah. to hear that. Uh, I Thanks know. so much. I know we were both excited me. to hear your takes. This was, this was awesome. I'm happy to talk to you guys, you know, having listened to you before and, you know, interacted with you both on, uh, on the Twitter. It's been really fantastic talking to you guys. It's just... This was everything I thought it would be and more. Thank you, buddy. Thanks so much. Thank you. This was a dream, buddy. Guys, how did you feel that went? I think it went great. Kyle, had you seen High Noon before? Did you watch it before this? No, I hadn't, but this felt like a really good opportunity to get introduced to it. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Western fan per se, but I do appreciate Westerns whenever they come on. And certainly in the middle of the the current times, it was nice to see somebody who is willing to to do the right thing amidst um, so many people essentially just trying to keep the status quo and constantly being like pushed up against the wall and feeling like you're not going to have enough time and just watching, you know, Gary Cooper just ultimately do what he needed to do in the face of, I, I guess, fear. Um, it's really inspiring, as, as, especially now. So it's sort of surprising to me that something what this came out like July in like 1952, something is still resonating so strongly um, today. This was a real treat for me. I'm glad I, I was really when 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 Kenny picked that I know we were both excited to really get to dive into this one so I'm glad you dug it too yeah I'm glad you dug it man this is an important one to me so based on that um uh, and based on the rules which we've set what would you pick which is not already in the National Film Registry uh, my pick is not something that would have been influenced by High Noon but it, it's certainly in the same field which is uh, I was thinking about the fact that when you look at what's in the National Film Registry, you know, it's not just features, it's it's other things, it's shorts, it's newsreels. And there were also three film serials in the National Film Registry. There's The Perils of Pauline, The Exploits of Elaine, and then later Flash Gordon. But I was thinking about a very important figure in American pop culture, one of the most influential characters of American pop culture, especially for the place that we're in now, that is part of the Western genre, but also kind of bridges the gap from the Western into the superhero film that we have today, which is the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger isn't represented in the the film registry at all right now. And I think that, you know, uh, the, the 1938 uh, Republic film serial of the Lone Ranger, which is the one that uh, starred Lee Powell and chief thundercloud as Tonto is a hugely important film serial. If you, if you like film serials, uh, it was 15 episodes and what they did that was so engaging about it was the fact that they were very smart about most film serials will basically give you an info dump in the first installment, and then you're just tuning in each time to see some new adventure, whereas this one, in a way that would later influence how television unfolds, would introduce new information 
throughout the serial. And the thing they did so smart is if you guys know the traditional Lone Ranger story, uh, it's the idea of, you know, a, a Texas Ranger who his entire troop is, is ambushed. He's the only one that survives. But in this serial, they had, I think, four or five different actors playing different characters as part of this posse. And you weren't sure which one was actually the Lone Ranger until the end. So it kept people coming back each week because there was this suspenseful element of, well, who is it? Which guy is the Lone Ranger? Because he's this masked character and this, you know, this this alter ego. So I think that it's, it's so influential. Uh, and I think that you don't have, whether it's, you know, you, you don't get Batman without Zorro and the Lone Ranger. Like, there's so many elements to that. And I think it's such an important part of American popular culture that we need to make sure that that's uh, preserved. It's always weird for me when I think about these things because uh, I I always go for movies. But then, you you know, with your pick, it kind of just reminds you like, yeah, they, they don't just do movies like it's going to there'll be others, you know, not t- quote unquote movies, but like serials, like you said, and. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a pretty pretty good choice there, Mikhail. Thank you. Oh, um, what about you, Tom? Well, um, I guess um, I'm a little more uh, literal-minded in the sense of I'm, I was looking for movies that feel like they were inspired by uh, High Noon. But it is weird in that there aren't many that kind of really do have that same structure like there's a lot of Rio Bravo knockoffs where it's just that structure and they just change the setting. There's not many just new high noons in a different setting. One came to mind and I felt like the influence is not immediately apparent, but uh, as a movie that does what High Noon does very interestingly, which was have a clear moral sense of self while also delivering a world and characters that themselves are not one note moral symbols for a storyteller to just say, this is good, this is bad, add a real muddy sense of things that maybe the world isn't as clear as it should be, but there should be a clear sense of morals uh, about a guy in a a, a place that is not all that helpful to him, has to, on his own do something that may end about bringing his destruction. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's one of the few movies that actually gets uh, tears from me every time I watch it. It is the best movie I think this director's ever made, and it's, i pretty sure, top five for this actor. I'm going to go with Man on Fire. I think it's Tony Scott's best movie. I think it's one of Denzel's best movies. I think the... Uh, it's not... It's not an absolute ripoff of it. You know, John Creasy is not Gary Cooper and he's not Will Kane. Um, but I feel like you think about it, they expand it, you know, so it's more like Mexico is the place that is kind of corrupt and has no interest in helping this guy who's trying to do the right thing because it doesn't benefit their own interests. Um, Will Kane is a guy, uh, John Creasy's a guy who knows he's in over his head, but he has to do this one thing because it's the one thing that it's just the one thing that makes him feel human. He can't do it and go to his great. It's just, I feel like there's a lot of stuff in there that I think whether subconsciously or not, Tony Scott and that team really, uh, looked at high noon and, whether specifically high noon or just all the movies high noon has inspired. Like we were talking about die hard has some of that high noon uh, stuff in it. For that reason, I think Tony Scott is kind of one of our least understood. One of our most underappreciated filmmakers in the genre world. He kind of changed cinema in ways. Many people don't like to really admit Um, he he's uh, and you know, just Denzel is one of our greats and as much Denzel as we can put in the film registry to kind of just show the breadth of this guy's talent that he could go from a Mo Better Blues to a Malcolm X to Training Day to this. I mean, um, I just think Man on Fire has a lot to really um, add, especially in the 2000s where action movies and mainstream kind of populist movies were not really good. And this movie really kind of stood out. The fact that it is a genuinely emotional movie for a movie that could get as horrifically violent as it does that there's this strong emotional core to it that i think isn't that far off from what high noon um was doing back in 1952 so uh i i would say man on fire i think is kind of perfect choice for high noon 
That's interesting too, because because I was trying to think. Uh, there is there's only one Tony Scott film in the registry at at, at present. That's that's Top Gun. Yeah, uh, which is which is a weird one because it, I would I would argue, and I, I hope uh, nobody yells at me for this, not that representative of the Tony Scott we later get. Um, no, not I feel really. Like, I feel like if you look at, you know, that's well, Top Gun was what his second movie, right? I think it no his feature third movie. I think he did Hunger and then Beverly Hills Cop two, then Top Gun. No, Beverly Hills Cop two is eighty seven. Uh, oh, Top so, Gun's eighty six. Uh, Oh, and so that's, that's what just I was... the second movie, yeah. So what's interesting is if you look at Beverly Hills Cop 2, even though I don't necessarily love that film, that, I think, gives you more of a sense of the Tony Scott we would later get with things yeah. like Last Boy Scout or, or Enemy of the State than Top Gun. Well, it's just I do understand the Top Gun thing just because the his filmmaking oh, style, not, not even just in terms of, like, the impact it had, but just, like, the, the filmmaking and how he was kind of the guy that really brought the MTV sensibilities to film with that rapid cutting. Everything looks like it's super glistening and shot, uh, you know, in a magic hour and everything's yeah. just rapid cutting. He, he brought that to it that would get, you know, that he would continue – to hone and uh, advance to the almost hypnotic mental breakdown way he does it in Man on Fire that, you know, then you'd also get guys like Michael Bay and the other Jerry Bruckheimer guys of the 90s would really take on to the point that cinema kind of broke itself in the 2000s trying to outdo that. And we're kind of now back to a place where action and mainstream cinema doesn't have to be that hyperactive in its editing and filmmaking to be popular with with the, the youth these days. Thank you for listening. And thanks to Kenny Nybart for joining us. His show, Podcast Like It's 1999, has new episodes every Wednesday wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow him on social media at Nybart. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. And we'll see you next time.